Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, it's here's this, the 13th summer workshop of the mathematics department of University of Brasilia. Uh, we thank you for your participation. And now we are going to do the plenary, the dynamical system plenary. And I would like to thank also the the presence of Professor Martin Hasmussen of Imperial College. Uh, thanks for accepting the invitation, Martin. Thank you very much for inviting. So I thank you. I thank you on behalf of the, of the organizing committee. And Martin is going to talk uh, to us about bifurcations in random dynamical systems. So. Uh, in this format, if you have any comments or questions, please leave on the on the comments on the on the YouTube. I think it's down below YouTube. And after Martin's talk, uh, I will read the comments and make the the questions you make in in the comments. Okay. So thank you for our participants. Thank you for for the assistance that are helping us for, to make the conference in this format. And without further ado, thank you, Martin. You, you can begin. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak at this workshop. And thanks to you, Lucas, uh, Jacqueline, and Mato Fu for organizing this meeting. It's a summer meeting, and uh, it's currently winter here in London. It was freezing tonight, so that's quite a special experience. So in my talk, I would like to give an overview about recent progress in random bifurcation theory. And this is joint work with Mark Calloway from University of Exeter. Uh, Tyson Duan from Vietnam Academy of Sciences, Maximilian Engel from uh, Free University of Berlin, Jeroen Lem, who is my next door neighbor at Imperial, and Christian Rodriguez from Unicamp. Let me first say something about the theory of uh, random dynamical systems. So the theory of random dynamical systems was initiated by Ludwig Arnold and his Bremen group in the 1980s and 1990s. And in his monograph on random dynamical systems, Ludwig Arnold describes how the classical dynamical system theory can be extended into the random dynamical system setting. And one small chapter in his book on random dynamical systems also deals with basic results on bifurcation problems. But even so, his book appeared 20 years ago, a commonly agreed notion on a bifurcation. So what should be a bifurcation for a random dynamical system has not been found and the reason for this is perhaps that the random theory is quite different from the deterministic bifurcation theory and in my talk i would like to explain some recent approaches and results we have achieved on bifurcations in random dynamical systems so we look at uh, first at the deterministic uh, dynamical system generated by this ordinary differential equation x dot is equal to f of x so, and we assume that this uh, differential equation depends on some parameter alpha. And we also assume that we have certain bifurcations in alpha. So this means in particular, when we change alpha, that the behavior of our uh, dynamical system uh, depends, uh, changes qualitatively at bifurcation points. And the main question I would like to ask and also partially answer in, in this talk is, uh, do bifurcations survive if we add noise to this uh, differential equation? So in, in, in contrast to our ordinary differential equation, we would look then at a stochastic differential equation where we have some random inputs in, in form of, uh, of Brownian motion that perturb the dynamics of our, our ordinary differential equation. And there are basically two uh, uh, ways to approach this uh, problem. So we can study this problem from the so-called statistical perspective. And here we um, accumulate all possible uh, noise realization. And so the, the, the dy dynamics can be then described as follows. So normally when you have a, a, a classical deterministic dynamical system, when you start in some point X and you move, move some time, you end up in another point, but now you have a, uh, a, a random dynamical system. So you have some randomness there. So you would start from some point X and you look at, uh, at the situation after, after time T has elapsed. And then you would get a probability distribution. And if the time T is very small, this and, and this is a perturbation of a, of a deterministic dynamical system, 
then this probability distribution will be will be centered around this uh, deterministic evolution. So you have a, a probability distribution which which describes where you can go. And then you can ask what is the behavior for the limit t goes to infinity. And then in certain cases, you converge uh, to a distribution which is the stationary distribution and which describes the statistics of the system. And then there is the dynamical perspective. So we do not ac accumulate, uh, when, when looking at uh, the dynamical perspective, we do not accumulate uh, all possible noise realizations, but we distinguish between all possible noise realizations. And we can then uh, get a description by a random dynamical system. So I will just dis dis describe this in a moment. So here the evolution depends specifically on the noise realization omega here, and this allows to study dynamical properties. So let me first explain this by means of a simple example, which is given by the Hopf bifurcation. So the Hopf bifurcation is, is a, a bifurcation scenario which you observe in two-dimensional differential equations in particular. And the differential equation here is, is, uh, is, is, um, is this displayed here and depends on certain parameters. And you have the Hopf bifurcation when you vary alpha and the Hopf bifurcation occurs at alpha equal to zero. So what does this mean? So for alpha less than zero, when we look at the phase portrait, the zero equilibrium, so this differential equation has, has a zero equilibrium. The zero equilibrium is asymptotically stable. So when we run the system forward in time, then we spiral towards zero and all the orbits converge to zero forward in time. And if alpha becomes positive, the zero equilibrium becomes unstable. So we spiral out of zero forward in time. So we, uh, we the, the equilibrium is repulsive, but then at the same time, we have some non-linearities with press solutions back. And then there is some balancing act going on between the repulsive equilibrium and the non-linearities, which cause some dissipation in the system. And you get a, a, a new object arising, which is a periodic orbit. So this is then the, the new invariant object, which is created at this bifurcation point. And uh, so I should say that there are also other parameters, which I have uh, um, put here into the, uh, the Hopf bifurcation. So we have the parameter beta here. So this just, so beta just describes the rotation of the system. And we have to assume that beta is unequal to zero because if beta is equal to zero, we could have potentially some equilibria and we may not get a, a, a periodic orbit here, but some other invariant set. And there is a shear parameter um, B here. So shear basically describes um, how um, how the how the speed of rotation depends on on the radius, and if the shear is high, uh, the, the 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 speed is much different at, at, at a different radii, and that's not so important here in this deterministic context. But we will see that shear is a very important quantity for bifurcations uh, in the random context. And now, if you look first at the statistical perspective, so one can one can show that there is a unique stationary measure for this uh, for the soft bifurcation given by uh, by this this function here and how does the stationary measure look like so for alpha less than zero um, the statistic concentrates around our um, our trivial zero equilibrium so that's not so surprising and when alpha becomes becomes positive you have this attracting limit cycle this attracting periodic orbit and then the statistics is also concentrated around this object, and uh, so this is this is what uh, what researchers have studied in the 1980s and 1990s, and that was what was called phenom phenomenological bifurcation. So the Hopf bifurcation admits a phenom phenomenological bifurcation in the sense that its stationary distribution, which describes the statistics of the system, changes qualitatively here from a unimodal distribution to a crater crater-like distribution, and so. Um, there are some drawbacks to this approach of phenomenological bifurcation. So in particular, defining what a phenomenological bifurcation is, is not so clear, especially if you have more complicated examples, like you can have uh, distributions which have many different peaks, maybe 1 million peaks, and you add another peak. So then you would ask, is this really a bifurcation? What goes on here? And also the, the other drawback is that 
a phenomenological bifurcation focuses only on statistical properties and is not linked to any any dy dynamics of the system. And we will will see this this in a moment, especially for this example of the Hopf bifurcation. So to study dynamics, we would look at a so-called random dynamical system. And I will give a give a brief introduction into what a random dynamical system is and. For more information, please consult the, the book, which I've mentioned in my introduction, uh, written by Ludwig Arnold on random dynamical systems. And so we have a, st a stochastic differential equation here with additive noise, and this induces a random dynamical system. And a random dynamical system is a combination of essentially two systems, which I call theta and phi here. So there's the theta system, which, which, is, uh, which models the noise, and this, this, the system model the noise influences the, the system describing the dynamics. So, but, but the, 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 uh, the, the system describing the dynamics does not influence the noise system. So the noise system is completely independent and influences this uh, dynamical system. And uh, what we do here is we, we, um, we have two systems and, but both are in some sense dynamical system. Actually, if you consider both systems together, you get a skew product dynamical system. So skew product in the sense that one influences the other and not vice versa. And so the, the, the system model the, modeling the noise is on a Godic dynamical system on a, on a probability space. And uh, the, the system modeling the dynamics is, is a co-cycle and it depends here on this omega. And when you evolve, you, you move from some omega to some theta t omega, you evolve the noise in time, but you at the same time you evolve the dynamics. And to some extent you can view omega as some noise realization, but you can view it also as some kind of initial time. And then the, the, the noise evolves. So you, 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 when you then look at the dynamics after time t, so you are no longer at omega, you are at theta t omega because the, the noise evolves at the same time. So um, just to, to, to uh, describe some properties of this random dynamical system. So as I said, the system model the noise is a classical dynamical system with an ergodic invariant measure P. And so this means that if you start in omega, no time elapses, you are still in omega. And you have the group property that if you, if you start in omega, you look at what happens after time T plus S. So this means that you start in omega, go forward at time S. And then you take this result and go forward time t, and you get to get the same. So the the dynamics is modeled by a co-cycle, and the co-cycle fulfills in particular two properties. So first, we have the initial value property that we, if we start at the initial condition omega, or you can even say the initial time omega in some point x, and no time elapses, you 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 stay in x. And the co-cycle property is best described with this diagram here. So you start in the omega fiber at some point x, and you're interested what happens at time t plus s, then you're in this point here, so phi of t plus s omega x. But you can get to the same point if you stop at time s. So this means you are in the theta s omega fiber in the point phi of s omega x. And then you take this point here as new initial point, and as new initial time, or as new noise realization, you have the evolved uh, uh, evolved omega, which is theta s omega, and you go t forward, and you get the same result. So um, coming back to our Hopf bifurcation, so the main question is now, are there any qualitative changes in the dynamics, which you can see from the random dynamical systems point of view under variation of the parameters? And it turns out, uh, as I will demonstrate in a moment, that the dynamics changes under variation of the shear parameter. So the shear parameter had no influence on the deterministic bifurcation, but now we will see a bifurcation when we change the shear. And that's quite remarkable uh, under, under the, uh, given that we have a stationary distribution which does not depend on, on, on the shear parameter. So the stationary distribution, the statistics of the system is completely independent on, on the shear, but we will see a dynamic bifurcation, which happens when we change the shear parameter, which definitely you would not see from the statistical perspective. And uh, let me just describe this now. So we look at two different situations. One situation is where we have a small shear. So in particular, we look at a simulation where we have shear equal to zero. And then we look at a contrasting picture when, when shear is large. So we fix some parameters, and in particular here, 
I fix alpha equal to one, which means we are after the bifurcation. We have a limit cycle, a periodic orbit in uh, our deterministic system. And then we fix also some noise realization and we are interested in the dynamics for this particular noise realization, but it's a typical noise realization. So what I described now holds for almost all noise realizations. And we start in many different points. So we pick 5,000 points and here the way I, I, I have set this up. So we assume that these 5,000 points are distributed according to the stationary distribution, which is somehow uh, distributed uh, uh, around uh, the, the, the limit cycle. So we start with these 5,000 points, we fix the noise realization, and we look what happens forward in time. And so you start at time t equal to zero. So here you are in the omega fiber, and then we move to the theta t omega fiber. And so you see that these um, points now accumulate around this limit cycle, which seems to be very reasonable because this is an attracting object. But, but what is maybe slightly surprising if you have not seen this before, is that you then evolve, uh, when you then evolve further, so when we look at the system at time uh, t equal to 20, so when we are in the theta 20 omega fiber, then suddenly all these points accumulate very closely to, to this point here. And this phenomenon is called synchronization. And we could we could prove that whenever shear is small, that you that you have synchronization in your system. So here we obtain an estimate. This is admittedly not a very sharp estimate, but at least it, it, it shows that for small shear you have synchronization. And what does synchronization mean? So let's uh, let me describe this in detail. So synchronization means that if you fix a noise realization, so for almost all omega, uh, you fix a noise realization, and then you look at two different initial conditions. So we look at some x, y, and some x bar, y bar in R2, and we run the system forward, and we compare the evolutions of these two noise realizations, then we converge to zero. So this, they, we have an, they, they attract each other, these points. We have, we have synchronization. And then the question is, to, to what point do these, uh, do these orbits converge? And one can show that there is a so-called uh, uh, random fixed point, so, uh, and this random fixed point is globally attracting and it's the unique random fixed point in this situation. And the random fixed point is, uh, is the, the easiest object, uh, the easiest invariant object of a, of, a, uh, of a random dynamical system. So basically you have a, a, a fixed point or a point for each omega. So this is a mapping from, from omega to R2. And if you say, say start in, so it's an invariant object in the sense that if you start in this A of omega and the omega fiber and you move T forward, then you stay at this random fixed point, but you, you get the fixed point evaluated at uh, theta T omega. And of course, if you have a random perturbation, in particular additive noise perturbation, you can never expect that anything stays fixed and constant. But here you have an object which as a, uh, as a mapping on this on this uh, omega space, you have an object which which stays fixed. And if you just look back into in our simulation, so here this would be the a the a theta twenty of omega. And so the question is, where is this random fixed point here? So it could be, for instance, here. Um, so this would be a a a theta three omega, and this would be just a omega would be somewhere here. And the point is that this this object uh, changes in time, and it, it if you, if you increase faster time, and if you look at the statistics of this object, so this point will just fluctuate around, and it, it will be distributed according to the stationary distribution. But as we see here in this example, it will attract um, all the other points. So all the other points converge to this attracting fixed point forward in time. And so how do we prove this? So the proof goes that one looks at, makes some estimates on the Lepunov exponents, and one can show that both Lepunov exponents of the system uh, are negative. And uh, we, can, uh, we can then apply modern results on, on synchronization for higher dimensional systems uh, uh, from uh, Franco Flandoli, Benjamin Guess, and Michael Scholz in a paper which in particular proved that under certain uh, scenarios when you have negative Lepin of exponent, which describes local attraction properties that you have more global uh, synchronization properties of your random dynamical system. So let me maybe explain something about Lepin of exponents because Lepin of exponents will appear later in all kinds of variations in this talk. And so let's focus on a, on a very sim simple situation 
that when we have a, a, a random fixed point of a random dynamical system, so we just assume that we have a d-dimensional system here. And so if you have a classical deterministic dynamical system and you have a fixed point to understand the local behavior in this fixed point, you would just take a look, look at the Jacobian of the right hand side, and then you would look at eigenvalues and then you would get eigenspaces, which give you some information on stable and unstable manifolds and so on, and on, on the stability. And you do essentially the same here. But here we have an, a non-constant object, which is which represents our fixed point. And we would linearize in this object by just looking at the co-cycle and we take the derivative with respect to x of this co-cycle and we look at uh, how does this linearization evolve in time. So basically you have evolving matrices here and now the stability of this object depends on whether these matrices uh, um, explode um, exponentially fast or contract exponentially fast. So in particular, if you have negative Lyapunov exponents, you will get local stability. So, so this uh, random fixed point will be will be locally attracting. And the uh, multiplicative ergodic uh, theorem proved by Oscillates in the 1960s says the following. So if our linear random dynamical system, which we get from linearizing around this uh, random fixed point, fulfills certain integrability condition, then there exists a D Lyapunov exponent where the number of Lyapunov exponents is bounded by the di dimension of the system. And to each Lyapunov exponent, there exists a uh, oscillated space, OI, and fiberwise, um, we get a decomposition of RD in these oscillated spaces. And these oscillated spaces are invariant under the uh, random dynamics. So if I start in this O1 of omega and uh, move time t forward, you, I will be in O1 of theta t omega. So they are invariant in the sense what we have seen for this random fixed point. And the Lyapunov exponent, so the exponential growth rates, um, when you start in these oscillated spaces are given by, by these Lyapunov exponents. And of, if you don't start in these oscillated spaces, you would normally uh, converge. Also, you would also see these Lyapunov exponents. And, and normally, if you if you don't really choose the initial condition very specifically, you would you would see the top Lyapunov exponent. So the largest Lyapunov exponent, which is lambda p here. Okay, so let's, let's now look at the situation when we have large shear. And we do, so this was uh, first studied by Sebastian Witscherek in 2009. So he has observed that when you have large shear, then you do not have this phenomenon of uh, synchronization. So in particular, we do the same as before. So we just start with, uh, initial conditions distributed to the stationary density, but we have now, uh, uh, we change now the parameter to the shear parameter to eight, which was zero before. And we do the same experiment, but now we see we do not have synchronization. We get convergence to some non-trivial object, uh, which looks a little bit like a, a, a chaotic attractor. And indeed one can, uh, look at numerics and one can see that the top Lyapunov exponent in this situation is positive. So you have some kind of chaos which is created by the shear, but it's an open problem how to actually establish this analytically and how to describe this uh, this, this, this bifurcation induced by shear um, more precisely. So in particular, it's, it's quite unclear what is this, what, what is this attractor for an object. Uh, so is it some kind of unstable manifold? So this, all these questions haven't, haven't been answered. And, uh, so I would like to, 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 to stress now so that what this bifurcation, which we have uh, seen here is not the, the, quite the bifurcation, which we have seen in the, in the deterministic scenario. So in the deterministic scenario, we created this, this limit cycle. And then we add noise and then we have a different parameter which produces some different phenomenon. So in particular, when we look at the stochastic, uh, at, the, at the Hopf bifurcation, and we set shear equal to zero, so which I have done here for this differential equation, and we add noise, then according to our synchronization result, we would always get an attracting random fixed point for all alpha. And one can say that in, 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 in this uh, sense, we destroy this uh, deterministic bifurcation by by adding noise, and uh, so in the in the following uh, in the remaining part of my talk, I would like to challenge this view. I would like to say that even so, you have this uh, uh, attracting random fixed point for all alpha, <clears throat> which seems to be a very simple, or which is a very simple dynamical object. <clears throat> 
which describes the uh, the, the long-term behavior of your of your random dynamical system. I would like to uh, demonstrate that uh, this is this is not the full answer to this question, and that uh, there are still some some things to explore, which indicate that you still have a, a, a bifurcation present there. And I would like to explain this in a, in a simpler context uh, for a one-dimensional bifurcation given by the Pitchfork bifurcation. So let, let me quickly set this up. So we look at a one-dimensional differential equation, x dot is equal to alpha x minus x to the three. So this is a, a prototypical example for a deterministic Pitchfork bifurcation. So what does this mean? So for alpha less than zero, we have only one fixed point, which is given by x equal to zero, and which is uh, globally attracting. And then we change stability of this fixed point when alpha becomes positive. So we get a repelling fixed point when alpha is positive, and we create two additional fixed points given by plus minus square root of alpha, which are, which are both attracting. And now we do the same as before. We can look at the statistical <coughs> uh, statistical perspective. So we get the existence of a, a unique stationary distribution, which is given here by this by this one-dimensional density. And maybe not so surprisingly, the shape of this density looks like this. So we, for for alpha less than zero, we have only one fixed point. The statistics is concentrated around this fixed point. But then <clears throat> at the bifurcation point alpha equal to zero, we, uh, we the, the, the <clears throat> deterministic fixed point x equal to zero becomes uh, repulsive. So the um, statistics is no longer concentrated so much here, but concentrates around the two other fixed points, which 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 are both both attractive. And this means in particular that you have a phenomenological bifurcation going on here. So you move from a unimodal distribution to a bimodal distribution. And so, what is the um, the <clears throat> dynamical picture? So, the dynamic picture. So, this question was answered by <clears throat> Hans Karl and Franco Flandoli in 1998. So, they have showed that you also have uh, synchronization for this uh, um, pitchfork bifurcation. So, this means in particular that when you fix the noise realization for almost all noise realization, and you take two uh, different initial conditions that forward in time you converge to each other and you also have a, a globally attracting random fixed point in this situation so this is exactly the same as in the in the Hopf bifurcation when we have small shear however the proof uh, how they proved this it was completely different so so let me first uh, explain so it's actually quite easy here to compute the Lyapunov exponent so something which is in the higher dimensional case quite complicated problem but in one dimensions, you can you don't need the multiplicative ergodic theorem. You need the Birkhoff ergodic theorem, and you basically and here we have the I explained on the previous slide. So here you, we have the unique stationary distribution. We have a formula for that, and so so basically you have to just integrate the derivative of your deter deterministic part, um, uh, um, and you weigh it with uh, respect to the to the stationary distribution, and one can immediately see that this is negative. So, if negative Lyapunov exponents, so locally you you are you are you are you are, you are attracting, and uh, but but the proof uh, Hans Kraul and Franco Flandoli have have made is completely different. So they use a correspondence between a statistical object and a dynamical object, and you have one. A unique statistical object, which is given by the unique stationary distribution, and the correspondence theorem says that there is one dynamical object um, given by an, uh, an uh, invariant measure for this for the random system. But if you have now an attractor, so basically the attractor is here given by the random fixed point. If you have a more complicated attractor, you you can in, in one dimensions is more complicated attractor is just an interval, and then because of monotonicity you can look at the endpoints of this interval, and you would get actually by the by the correspondence theorem that this would correspond to two different stationary distributions. But because we have only one different different stationary distributions, we cannot have non-trivial attractors here in this situation. So the proof was uh, was completely different. They have given and relies on one-dimensional arguments. But uh, let me now summarize. So <clears throat> we have the deterministic pitchfork bifurcation, and we have the the random pitchfork pitchfork model and what is the difference so in the deterministic pitchfork model we have synchronization if and only if alpha is is, is negative and we have 
one fixed point for negative alpha and three fixed points for positive alpha. And in the random pitchfork model, we have synchronization for all alpha, and we have one random fixed point for all alpha, and we have negative Lyapunov exponents for all alpha. So this indicates in particular that if you add noise to this pitchfork bifurcation, that you destroy this bifurcation. But I would like to demonstrate now that this is not the final answer to this question. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> basically, um, so we have to understand first, so what does it actually mean that you have synchronization? And so what it means is that you, you take some limit, t goes to infinity. So uh, synchronization means that at some point you come very close, but this can take a very long time. And I would like to, in particular, to, take, uh, to discuss some finite time effects, which indicate that the bifurcation is not destroyed, that the bifurcation is still there. Um, then also one has to see that if these two fixed points, so if alpha is very large, so here you see um, on the top left corner, uh, this bifurcation diagram. So, so the, actually the difference to the Hopf bifurcation is that you have two different attractors. So for the Hopf bifurcation, you have only one attractor, which is given by the limit cycle, but here you have two attractors. So you have some kind of metastability. So if alpha is very large and the noise is not so large, you will spend very long time, say in, in the left, uh, near the, the left equilibrium, and then the large noise will kick you to the right equilibrium. So basically what we see here is also an effect which comes from the unboundedness of the noise because you have a stochastic differential equation. And I will in particular in the last part of, 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 of this talk, look at bounded noise as well in contrast to unbounded noise to see that the bifurcation can be still preserved and we, we look at a different model of noise. And then I would also like to uh, to explain a little bit about local analysis you can do instead of a global analysis to identify bifurcations. In particular, the Lyapunov exponents we look at, they are global objects. So they look at the global di dynamics, which uh, which happens here for this uh, this random, uh, random dynamical system. But basically, you may take the view, especially if you have metastability, that you can actually look at different regions and you can you want some dynamical indicators which say something for this particular region. But the Lyapunov exponent in some sense just takes all, all the areas in the whole space into account. Even so you may on a finite time scale not go to, to many areas. You may stick to, 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 to one area only and you may want to have information on that. And that's what I would like to explain in, in, the, in the second approach to explain that uh, bifurcation still persists. So um, how I'm doing with time. So I think I have 18 minutes left, meaning that I have to rush a little bit now. So we first look now at the finite time picture. And the first observation you make when you look at this, um, this attracting random fixed point is that you have a qualitative change in local uniform attractivity. So what does this mean? So what do we mean with local uniform attractivity? So we know the random fixed point is attractive. This means because we have negative Lyapunov exponent. So this means when you perturb this random fixed point, so we have here this A alpha of omega, which is our random fixed point in the omega fiber. You, we perturb this with some x, x is small. So we take here only small x into account, which contributes to, to the local attractivity. And then we look at the forward evolution what happens uh, then, and we would expect that we converge forward in time to uh, to this moving object now. So we take t goes to infinity, but we will converge to this um, this moving object to this random fixed point. And uh, uh, uniformly attractive now means that we look at the essential supremum of all omega, and it turns out that you have local uniform attractivity when alpha is less than zero, but you uh, do not have local uniform attractivity when alpha is greater than zero. In particular, one can make some exponential estimates on the attraction rates locally. And we, we get uh, an exponential decay with some constant k, which depends on omega. And this, this k of omega is bounded if and only if the uh, alpha is less than zero. So we have only local uniform attractivity when alpha is less than zero. So the question is now, shall we care about local uniform attractivity? And I think we should care about it because it has practical consequences in the sense that it influences our finite time observations. So in particular, I would like to look at now, not at the asymptotic object of a Lyapunov exponent, but at the so-called finite time Lyapunov exponent. 
And here we, again, as before, we linearize around our uh, random fixed point, a, a alpha. And we, but we do not take the limit t goes to infinity, meaning that, in particular, the finite time Lyapunov exponent here depends on omega. So this is a random variable. And if we take the limit t goes to infinity, we will converge to the, uh, to the classical Lyapunov exponent, which is, which is negative in, in this one-dimensional case. And so here you, we have some uh, uh, done some calculations on the distributions of these finite time Lyapunov exponents. So in particular, uh, when when alpha is negative, so we computed 400 finite time Lyapunov exponents, and we see they are all negative. And if but if alpha is positive, we get also a distribution of finite time Lyapunov exponent. But we see here that we have also positive finite time Lyapunov exponent. And the question is also what happens now if we increase time. So if we increase time, this distribution which we get from the finite time Lyapunov exponent becomes more and more centered around the true Lyapunov exponent. So you will converge to this uh, to this true Lyapunov exponent, but the support of this distribution of finite time Lyapunov exponents will always uh, be um, also positive in the case alpha is uh, bigger than bigger than zero, which indicates local uniform, um, uh, 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 not locally uniform attractivity in this case. So this means in particular that we have a finite time random bifurcation. So all the uh, finite time Lyapunov exponents um, are, are negative when alpha is less than zero, and the but the probability to observe a positive exponent uh, when when alpha is is positive is is positive, and so this uh, bifurcation is not indicated by the Lyapunov spectrum. So so uh, just remember when we looked at the at the um, at the Hopf bifurcation with shear, then the Lyapunov spectrum was changing sign and we had a change in our attractor but here we do not have this because the Lyapunov exponent is uh, is is strictly negative for all alpha but we see a change in the dichotomy spectrum which we have developed for random dynamical systems and i think i have to skip this because of time and i just want to say that um, when we look at the uh, dichotomy spectrum then we can compute this dichotomy spectrum here in this case and it indicates that we, we have a bifurcation because the dichotomy spectrum is given by the interval from minus infinity to alpha. And so it changes sign at alpha equal to zero while the Lyapunov exponent is strictly negative. So I would like to look now at the local analysis, which is joint work with Maximilian Engel and Jeroen Lamm. And so the idea is um, uh, that we that we localize uh, um, our random dynamical system. So we are only interested in what happens in a certain region of our random dynamical system. So we fix an interval and we are only interested um, in, in the dynamical systems, as I said, on this, on this interval i, meaning that if our uh, uh, random dynamical system leaves this interval, we kill the uh, dynamical system and we are no longer interested in that. So this motivates the definition of a stopping time. So we have now a time which depends on omega and x. And uh, so, so we start at the noise realization omega in some point x, and we look at the first time, so we start in this interval i, and we look at the first time that we move out of this interval so that we hit the boundary of this interval, and then we, 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 we stop and we're no longer interested in that. And then one can show that this, if we fix an x, one can show that this, uh, this this stopping time is exponentially distributed. So we have an exponential decay of of mass which stays in this in this interval i. And this exponential decay rate here corresponds to a, a, a decay which you which you see when you look at a quasi stationary measure. And it's actually so this uh, this depends on x here, and that's also Im important uh, when when we when we look at the, the following quantities. So we look at um, so-called conditioned finite time Lyapunov exponent. So the difference to what we do before is, so we look at a finite time Lyapunov exponent, a finite time exponent, but we do not have this. So before we linearized only in this uh, uh, attracting random fixed point, but we do not have this here because we have a situation where we only focus on a, on a specific interval. 
So we take a point x in, in our interval and we assume that when we start with noise realization omega that at time capital T, when we want to evolve our finite time exponent, that we are still in this interval. So T is less than the this, this stopping time. And then we look at the, the local behavior as long as we are in this interval. And then uh, a question to ask is, we look at this, this exponent here and we look at the expectation of this exponent under the condition that we have not left this interval. So if we, we, we do this for fixed x, and then we take the limit t goes to infinity and we could prove that this converges. And this is what we call the, the conditioned Lyapunov exponent. But now the question is, do you get in this limit, do you get a, a, a distribution of exponent or do you, do, they, do you become narrower and narrower towards a, a, a singular exponent, which is what would be given by this, this conditioned Lyapunov exponent. And indeed this is the case. So we converge in a strong sense uh, to this, um, to this uh, conditioned Lyapunov exponent in, in the sense of, of, of uh, convergence and probability, which is a, a strong sense in the context because we cannot speak about almost true convergence because almost truly you, you escape the interval because we have this uh, exponential decay here, which we observe, which comes from the quasi-stationary distribution. And then what we, could, what we could show is that we have a negative Lyapunov exponent. We have some local synchronization properties and we can look at some examples of this conditioned Lyapunov exponent when we look at the pitchfork bifurcation. So we can look in particular here at the conditioned Lyapunov exponent when uh, sigma is equal to one and the, uh, the the interval is fixed from minus one to one. And now we, we vary alpha, the bifurcation parameter. And of course, so first the, uh, the, the Lyapunov exponent, the conditioned Lyapunov exponent is negative. So at the at alpha equal to zero, we create this two attracting fixed point and we, we have a repelling fixed point, which is X equal to zero. And that uh, basically, but here the attracting fixed points still dominate, but at, at some point these attracting fixed points move move move, move out uh, with speed plus minus square root of alpha. And at some point when, when alpha is bigger than one, they are actually outside of the of the interval which we have fixed. So, but before we see already repelling behavior in this model. So we have, when we fix an interval and we vary parameter, we see that we have a change of stability in terms of these conditioned exponents. And we can do a similar experiment when we fix alpha equal to one. So this is a situation after the bifurcation. So here we have these two attracting fixed point, but then we increase our interval and we will see that when we increase our interval, so first if the interval is very small, so we only capture the repelling fixed point. So we have a, a conditioned positive Lyapunov exponent, but then uh, we become negative when we increase C because we more and more uh, capture uh, a, a very large interval where the two attracting fixed points um, are in this interval and in particular in the limit C to infinity, you would converge to the true Lyapunov exponent. So in the remaining part of the talk, I have only a few minutes left, I think seven minutes. I would like to explain uh, something about bounded noise, use of bounded noise instead of unbounded noise. And we will see that uh, that in the pitchfork bifurcation, we get in particular uh, two different uh, different sets, which um, but after the bifurcation, which uh, which can be can be isolated. So we, you you, ca you cannot synchronize anymore if you have bounded noise. And I would like to first motivate this in a in a in a more general setting. So here we look at the discrete time dynamical system. We look at the mapping F from RD to RD. And we, uh, so discrete time dynamical system means we just iterate this mapping and we describe the dynamics. So we map some point X to some point F of X and then we would map to F of F of X and so on. Uh, but now we use perturbations in each step and for simplicity, we just perturb by some ball of size epsilon greater than zero. So you, you make a perturbation of your dynamics and then you have to evolve this situation. And in particular, so this means that uh, you, so first you, when you would map deterministically, you would get F of F of X, but now you have this ball and you have to evolve this ball and you can take, for instance, four points in this ball and then you have to perturb these points and then, but maybe you get a better approximation of the, of the whole set 
uh, when you when you evolve the boundary and in the end you have to evolve all the points and you get to get a very large set here and you have to evolve these uh, these sets and you create a set value dynamical system which is uh, just given by iterations of these of these uh, closed epsilon balls of of f of x and we can look at the the pitchfork bifurcation here so for instance so this is an uh, 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 an invertible example of a deterministic pitchfork bifurcation so um so this is before the bifurcation you have a globally attracting uh, point x equal to zero and then you increase alpha so when alpha is equal to to one uh, we have non-hyperbolicity here at x equal to zero and we create two other fixed points uh, when when alpha is 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 greater than one and now we add noise and so so basically the set valued system you you read as it follows so if you have an x here this would be exactly the interval um which which you get so you have an uh, you have displayed here the extremal graphs and what we see here now is that we cannot escape this region here so the noise is not strong enough that we can escape and we have two so-called minimal invariant sets and we have no synchronization because we cannot really come from the right part to the left part but if we decrease now um, uh, the the the, the um, uh, bifurcation parameter alpha then we see that these extremal graphs they will lose connection with the identity line which is here in red and then suddenly we have a discontinuous bifurcation and we get one big minimal invariant set and we have synchronization on, on this set. And so this the bifurcation diagram, then so the perturbed bifurcation diagram looks like this. So we have uh, basically one minimal set where the dynamics takes place for alpha less than this bifurcation point. And then we have a discontinuous bifurcation here in, 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 in two different intervals where the dynamics takes place. And uh, so discontinuous set valued bifurcations, I would I, I should say, have been first studied by Alejan Homburg, uh, Todd Young, and Hisham Smaru. And we have looked in particular at what type of discontinuities you can get. And uh, when you look in particular at a saddle node bifurcation, so you here you have two saddle node bifurcations, and you, you, you see that um, uh, here you have an attracting fixed point and when you perturb this attracting fixed point and the perturbation is not large is not is not very large then you stay close to this um, to this fixed point and you and you have a minimal invariant set but then if you come closer and closer to this bifurcation point at some point the noise is large enough that you can actually jump that you can 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 move away from from your your, your fixed point and you this will not happen very likely if you're if you are far away from the bifurcation point, but it will happen. There is no asymptotic dynamics taking place uh, close to this uh, close to this attracting fixed point, and basically you have a disappearance of uh, of a minimal invariant set, and uh, and so this is these are essentially so we could prove that an explosion, a discontinuous explosion, and a dis disappearance of minimal um, minimal invariant sets. These are the only two. Uh, two bifurcations which which happen and that can be proved in in in, in a general setting of metric spaces and just in the last two minutes i would like to explain something about uh, repelling objects which you get here so basically the question is are there any minimal invariant sets close to these repelling points here which are of course very crucial for for the bifurcation and uh, one one cannot find uh, invariant sets close to these repelling equilibria because uh, basically if you perturb a little bit you move away from this equilibrium but uh, one can one can look at the so-called dual mapping which is in some sense the the inverse mapping of this of the set valued system so we look at uh, at a uh, point x and we look at all the xi in rd such that with your set valued uh, mapping you 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 can hit this x and uh, one can show that uh, if you have a discontinuous bifurcation either uh, in this in the subtle node case that you have a disappearance or you have a, a discontinuous explosion then this is uh, this is caused by a collision of uh, these minimal invariant sets which bifurcates with an invariant set with respect to this dual mapping and that is related to a, a mostly composition theory for set valued dynamical system, which was first established 
by Richard McGeehy in, in, in the 1990s. So let me now uh, conclude. Uh, so in this talk, we have uh, looked at the question whether adding noise to a dynamical system with a bifurcation preserves the bifurcation. And we have seen that we can destroy bifurcations, uh, in particular, when we have no shear, um, um, uh, we destroy the Hopf bifurcation and we destroy the pitchfork bifurcation. But at least when we look at the Hopf bifurcation, we can see that uh, by looking at the shear, uh, we, we still uh, recover some kind of bifurcation, but this bifurcation is not really linked to the deterministic case in particular as in terms of periodicity, which you see in the Hopf bifurcation. So I, I, I want, then wanted to make the case that the um, statement that the bifurcation is destroyed is is maybe um, maybe slightly pessimistic and I have indicated that the bifurcation uh, uh, when when we look at, at different quantities like finite time and conditioned Lepinov exponent that the bifurcation is still is still there in some sense and in particular we see this also when we replace unbounded noise with a bounded uh, noise level because then in the pitchfork case the two different uh, um, the two different uh, attracting points correspond to two different uh, minimal invariant sets and they would also carry two different stationary distributions when we look at the random dynamical systems. So thank you very much for your attention. Muito obrigado. Thanks a lot, Martin. Very interesting talk. Let, let's go to the, the, the questions. There are some questions in the comments. There's a little delay with it from seconds. No the problem. We'll get it here. Yes, so this, this is a very good question. Thank you, Mauro. So this is uh, this is true. The probability goes to zero. Maybe I quickly go. I do not share my screen right now. Okay, so maybe that's I can explain this. Uh, so the probability goes to zero, and one can, one can one can actually so the probability so this satisfies a large deviation principle. So if basically a Markov chain, and you can write the uh, the Lepinov exponent as an observable of the Markov chain. So this would satisfy a large deviation principle. So you have an exponential decay rate here. So if t goes to infinity, you see some exponential decay, and when one would need to look at the rate function which one can definitely not not really easily compute analytically but at least numerically one can one can compute this rate function and can see what what decay you have so so uh, so you have exponential decay of the of the probability that's true yeah nice thank you martin there are some further questions here for the comments uh Thank you, Mauro. Uh, Professor Yuri Damareskis uh, makes a two-part question. Part one is over there. Um, only noise process influences the dynamical system, but not the other way around in some physical situations. So what, what do you mean with not the other way around? I mean, how would the analysis change if you take noise that is dependent on the dynamical system? I mean, if you, you, you can do all kinds of different situations with noise. I mean, what uh, the noise I looked at was, uh, was white noise. And you can, of course, look at, at, at colored noise, and then you would get completely different phenomena, which are completely unexplored. So there's not much uh, theory on, on colored noise, what happens in bifurcations. But you would then get something uh, more, so you would get, even in the one-dimensional situation, more complicated scenarios. You, you would get in different invariant graphs with different attraction and repulsion properties, what you, for instance, see uh, when you have uh, uh, quasi periodically forced bifurcations or something like that. I'm not so sure what what you mean with uh, physical processes. So so you ask that in some physical situations something is not true. Let's see. Uh, 
I think Mauro, Mauro has another has an observation about this. Okay, so so I mean it really. So when you so so the, the whole problem with with unbounded noise is that you that you somehow create some artif. I, I mean for 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 many different in many different situations, modeling by stochastic differential equations is a very useful tool. But if you look at asymptotic objects, so this is this is one has to be a bit careful because you 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 somehow the unbounded noise of uh, of of noise creates some situations where where you you somehow mix so many so you can have a system with many different behaviors and many different parts of the space and the unboundedness of the noise would somehow mix everything up and so uh, from a practical perspective you would never really explore all these different parts only the unboundedness of the noise so you clue everything together artificially and in the long run you visit these different parts with certain probabilities but for the dynamical description in particular, if you look at Lyapunov exponents, you would only get one exponent and this exponent would just uh, give some kind of average. And in particular, what I explained about the local analysis. So, <clears throat> so we are, so, so here in this pitchfork case, it's, it's maybe not so, not so clear, but when you, for instance, look at uh, a situation you could have when you have a Botton bifurcation. So that's something we, we look at now currently. So you can have, some shear with a Botta bifurcation, so you have a uh, bifurcation with two limit cycles, and you can have then you have a meta stability between these two attracting uh, limit cycles, and you will in particular see that uh, you can create scenarios where one of these limit cycles uh, has a chaotic behavior due to shear, and where the other one has an attracting behavior. And on the on a finite time perspective, you you if you if you start close to the, to the chaotic one, you will see chaos all the time. But when you look at the the Lapunov exponent of the random system where you have additive noise, everything is just glued together, and you 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 may just see a negative exponent. Even so, on a on a on a, on a finite time horizon, you are you are near chaotic object, and that's why we introduced these uh, these local local exponent in order to to uh, to take such behavior into account and then of course one would make, need to make sure that the escape rates are not too high so that's something i haven't really spoken about but these escape rates come from the quasi stationary distribution and of course one would look at uh, regions in your phase space uh, which which are relatively stable so where you do not escape so fast Okay, I think Mauro has another question um, about this. So let's put this question. Then, then Yuri has an observation. But first, Mauro Patron, is the random noise Gaussian? Yes, the, uh, we, we assume, I, I mean, not in the bounded noise case. So in the bounded noise case, I haven't really spoken much about how to, to model this. But you can just look at a uniform noise, for instance, in the bounded noise case. So that's IID, um, and it's it's white noise in, in, in the bounded noise uh, case, because we look at discrete time. In continuous time, this is more complicated. So in the continuous time, you cannot really set it up like that. But because we look at a, a stochastic differential equation driven by a, a Wiener process, so you have a Brownian motion, a random inputs in form of a Brownian motion, yes. Nice. Mark says, thank you. And uh, about Yuri, uh, Yuri Damanes comments on, about his questions. The noise amplitude could depend on the instantaneous state of the dynamical system. I don't quite understand this question. So, so what do you mean with noise amplitude could depend? So the noise amplitude is in, in the model, the noise amplitude is set, but oh, I see. So you mean that, I see, so I think if you just look at the bounded noise case, so you mean that you have a, 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 a ball here, so you put here with an epsilon ball, and you mean that if you have a f of f of epsilon, it could actually be a different size of a ball, or it could, could be a completely different object. Yeah, so that is included in, in our theory. Also, we, for, for certain, uh, uh, I mean, uh, so this animation was created, for instance, by Kali Timpery, so he, he looks into, into uh, epsilon perturbations and looks at singularities which can 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 occur um, and in, in this case we assume that we have always a, a, a uniform 
from noise acting. But the, the theory which we have developed uh, with uh, Jeroen Lem and Christian Rodriguez, in particular, where we look at what types of bifurcation can happen. So here we have explosion and instantaneous disappearance. So for that, we can set this up in a very general setting. We can use different types of perturbations. So we just assumed that we have a set valued dynamical system and we need certain conditions like we need some, at least that you have a minimal size of, of noise perturbation. Otherwise you would not get these results. Otherwise you are too close to a deterministic system. Um, but if you have a minimum size perturbation, you can have uh, state dependent noise here in this particular uh, set value dynamical systems context. Thanks. Uh, I have a question also. It's, uh, when you study uh, dynamical systems in the large, uh, at some points, I think you get tired of asymptotics because asymptotics, maybe it seems that they capture only exponential behavior and, and sometimes we need the the, the things I, I i i research with with model sometimes we have some new potent behavior that we would like to capture and we uh, i don't know a, a nice object to do so it's, it seems like some some it should be something that that is not asymptotic some but the, so you presented this this concept uh, which are uh, conditions that we need time for, for random dynamical systems. Do, do you see some correspondent co concepts for, for deterministic dynamical systems? Um, well, as it, this relies very heavily on that you have a random dynamical system. So if you go to deterministic context, of course, so, so I said something about quasi-stationary measures and quasi ergodic measures, which are important when we look at these objects so in particular this this expectation here so we, we would look at some we actually need to, to to prove the existence we need to look at some integral over some quasi ergodic distribution and so this is something which is extremely nice in the random context because you have a unique object and which where the corresponding counterpart, counterpart for in the deterministic context is is extremely pathological. So in the, in the deterministic context, this would be so-called uh, conditionally invariant measures. And so they, 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 there are lots of diff uh, different, uh, I mean, even for relatively simple scenarios, like just a tent map, you would get, get ex extremely many conditionally invariant measures and you would, would lose um, certain properties. And I've never really thought about uh, going with some of these ideas to the deterministic context. But of course, if you have a nice system, you could ask this question of local dynamics and you can condition on that in, in some sense. And you can, I mean, these, these, these measures which you get for deterministic systems, they are relatively pathological. I and see. so one, one can random, maybe- The randomness so smooths out. Yes, randomness smooths, makes things unique. And then it's it's relatively straightforward, at least from a con conceptual point of view, what to look at and how to how to study it. And for deterministic systems, this is I mean, even absolutely con continuity is no longer an exclusive criterion when you look at conditionally invariant measures. So it's much much less clear what quantities to look at uh, when you have a deterministic system. But it's a very good question. Nice. So let's let me see if I have another question. Or... Just many thanks for for your talk. <laughs> Thank you, Lucas. It was really a pleasure to to speak in Brazil, and I feel really warm now <laughs> from <laughs> too, from the, the cold 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 winter here outside. But maybe I go for a walk later, and then it disappears again. <laughs> but at least at least for this hour, I, I was feeling very summery. Thank you very much for for, for inviting me. A great honor to talk. To, to watch her talk, to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you, everyone, for, for, all, for all your questions. Thank you. Thank you for the assistance also. So, so when we declare this, this talk, the end of this talk. And see you further, further more in the Congress. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>